Is that okay? Yeah. Do you want me to start again? It's okay. Yeah, I can do that. I said I work with these people every day, but when I actually sat down and had to put things onto paper in a clear and concise way, I have to say that I struggled, so it wasn't really a piece of cake after all. <laughs> um, the dietary management of the obese patient is clearly complex for us all, and it's certainly very difficult, and at times it can be extremely frustrating. And the numbers are, without a doubt, climbing. Okay, for you, the surgeon, a consequence of the increasing obesity epidemic is the increased number of patients that are requiring surgeries related to the medical complications of obesity. It is well recognised and reported that obese patients experience poor perioperative and post-operative outcomes compared to normal weight patients. This may be explained by the presence of obesity-related comorbidities, so things like type 2 diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, the list goes on, and they all cause metabolic abnormalities. But it can also be explained by the patient's increased abdominal or thoracic adiposity and enlarged fatty livers. Surgeries performed on the obese patient can be more, technic more technically difficult and more time-consuming. So my next slide just shows you the benefits to the surgeon from reducing weight. Um, so like I said before, the reduced intra-abdominal or thoracic adiposity, the reduced liver size, improved exposure and view of anatomical landmarks, the reduced conversion rate to open surgery and improved safety of surgery. And then the benefits to the patient. So obviously they get better control of their comorbid um, situations reduce length of operation, reduce hospital stay, um, and improve post-operative outcomes. So not just the healing and the rehabilitation, I was thinking about orthopaedic surgeons as well. Obviously, if you're going to do a new knee or a new hip or some sort of prosthetic device, you want to make sure that it, you get the most out of it. So clearly, the, the patient needs to move weight. Um, prior to the surgery and we want to move them along the spectrum. Basically, we're not going to turn them from that far, what side's that for you, the far left, um, and to the far right. We're not going to make them skinny. So I guess you as the surgeon have to consider how far along that spectrum you're willing to cope with and what you think that patient can achieve and I guess depending on where you're trying to access the patient and what surgery you've got in question. Okay, so we all know that diets fail. Unfortunately, real life is not like a controlled mouse study. I mean, I would just love it if I could just conjure up a plan for a patient, lock them away in a little room, have a bit of an adult, I don't know, you know, tr human treadmill, and just give them what they need, because I guarantee most of them would lose weight. Not all of them, but most of them. But, you know, the reality is, is that there's a lot of, um, what's the word? you know, things that contribute to obesity out there that are external factors that are really testing the patient every day. So they might leave from you and feel quite motivated that they need to lose 10 kilos, 20 kilos or whatever and shake your hand and say, I will do the job, I'm really excited for the surgery, I want to do the best thing and have the best outcome. But when they get out there, it's a very different story. So this is a great um, slide that I just found recently on the obesity.org site. Um, and if you go to that website and you go to the Obesity Infographics 2015 section there, you will find it. So it just shows that diets, that little orange part up there, but of course all these other things including genetics and, you know, medications and all sorts of things will input or affect um, the patient's outcome or their compliance to any diet plan. Okay, so what do we do then? Because this is bigger than Ben-Hur, isn't it? And, you know, I can't make them skinny either. And most people, I think, have been on that dieting merry-go-round. So they've lost bits of weight and then they regain and often more. So they're very good at losing weight. And people come and see me and they say, I know everything that I should be eating and everything that I shouldn't be eating, but I just can't keep it up. It's too hard. Okay, so I think when you're faced, the patient's faced, 
with surgery, I think we just need to break things down and try and get them to the surgery in the best shape and form that we can for that particular person. Okay, here we go, number one. This is my first tip, establish a weight loss goal. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the first important thing. And we, surgeons tell patients a wide variety of different things. So some people might say that patient needs to lose 30 kilos, and it might be in a year. For some patients, they might be told that they have to lose it in two months, which is a bit of a tall order. Okay, so first of all, defining when we're trying to decide how much the patient needs to lose, um, our universal indicator is BMI. So we all know that that's weight in kilos over height in metres squared. Don't rely on driver's licences, okay? <laughs> they're either too short or they're too tall. Usually they're too tall. Um, patients are very um, poor historians when it comes to their height. We all think we're taller than we are because it's cool. Um, so make sure you've got a good set of scales, or even if you don't have a good set of scales, you need to make sure that it will weigh over 150 kilos. You don't have to spend a fortune on that. It might not be the same as the patient scales if they happen to have a set that can weigh over 150 kilos anyway, but it may not be the same as the GP scales or, or whatever. Of course, people like to weigh themselves at the beginning of the day and they get upset when they come into your clinic and they weigh more because we've got shoddy scales, not them, but of course they're dressed and I don't really ask anybody to strip down or go to the toilet before they jump on my scales. But the important thing is that you're using the same set or they're using the same set and that they're comparing the weight that they get from their scales at home with the scales that you've got in your clinic because what we're talking about is a difference really, whether it's one 28 that they get down to, or 130 or 126, it really doesn't matter in the big scheme of things here. So BMI, um, for someone to be obese, that's when they have a BMI of more than 30. Now, it is then divided up into further categories. So you've got obese class 1, which is your BMI of 30 to 34.9, so the points are important. Um, class 2, especially if you're the person who's getting a BMI of that level, um, 35 to 39.9 and morbidly obese, which is a BMI of 40 or more. I used to get really excited in my clinics when I saw people with BMIs of about 40, 45, but now I find that that's increasing and I see it more regularly. I mean, I understand that. I work with Dr. George Hopkins, so I'm looking at a very, you know, different patient group there, but it really takes a BMI of 50 or even 60 <laughs> to get me excited these days. And they do come through the door now. Okay, you must be aware of the limitations of BMI. BMI is based on the standards for people of European descent. So if you have somebody who is of Asian descent or has an Indian background, it's not really a great indicator. In fact, it will overestimate, or yeah, it'll over, yeah, hang on, their BMI will underestimate um, how fat they are. Um, it's not suitable for use in children and adolescents of less than 18 years. Um, we often do the calculation because it's much easier than whipping out those growth percentile charts. But ideally, that's what you should be doing. Um, of course, BMI tells us nothing about the distribution of body fat. So, you know, somebody could have a BMI of 35 and be very different shapes, whether they're a male or a female, because of the different fat distribution. So you need to whip a tape measure out. Okay, it's also great for the patient to see changes in centimetres if they're not losing weight as well. So I think we're all pretty much um, up to speed with what um, Western or Europoid measurements are. But again, bear in mind that there are different measurements for Asians. Um, there's no consensus of, on what the Japanese should be, so they lump them in with the Asians. So that's still research that's happening there. Same with the ethnic South, South and Central Americans. Um, the Maori and the Pacific Islanders have their very own measurements as well, okay? All right, so my next one, how much should the patient lose? Okay, well, this is the million dollar question if you ask me and every patient will ask you and they will ask me and we'll probably give them very different answers. There is no standardised approach or consensus between disciplines and the amount of weight loss required is dependent on the individual's total weight, the area that you want to access and also their metabolic issues. 
so you know they might need to achieve a lower weight to get better glycemic control and the values that I've listed there might not be enough they might have to go further so if you look in the literature a lot of people sprout 10 to 15 percent of excess body weight so that's their current body weight minus the upper end of their healthy BMI range so that BMI of 25 um, others sprout 9 to 12 kilos or a lot of literature just rounds it to 10 kilos because that's the level that's usually associated with improved blood pressure, fasting blood glucose, cholesterol, triglycerides and LDL but of course you know it depends on people's genetic predisposition as well and I guess most surgeons just basically want the patient to lose as much as possible. So it is difficult to attach a figure but you really do need to have a clear goal for the patient. If you're not sure, I think you know you need to speak to the dietitian or whoever you're referring to to make sure that we're all working towards that common goal otherwise patients get a little bit upset. Okay, so the other thing I want you to remember to consider when you're establishing a weight loss goal as well is that you need to consider weight loss averages. Now, if you have, again, like, you know, if you go back to that mouse picture and we could stick them in a room and give them what they need and exercise them, you know, those figures might look very different. But what we see in reality is that women are usually only successful in sort of reaching up to about one and a half kilograms maximum per week. They may lose more um, at some periods throughout their dieting process, but usually that's the average rate. So they might lose two kilos one week, nothing the next week, one and a half kilos the next week. So no one really loses weight in that linear line down. For men, it's a different story because you guys have got more lean body mass than us. And I would argue, depending on, you know, how things go in the household, you're probably more removed from the kitchen. I take that back. If you're a hands-on person in the kitchen, you're a cook, I wish I had met you. Um, so men, about one and a half to two and a half kilos per week on average. Okay, the second thing that we need to do is that we need to agree a clear dieting strategy and again define a time frame. Okay, it also helps to d drive the patient if there is a surgery date in place, but not always. That old adage, you know, you can lead a horse to water but you can't make it drink often rings true. Okay, so where do you start? <laughs> Um, you know, there's such a maze of diets out there. There are 101 different dieting strategies that a patient can adopt and everyone out there these days, thanks to social media, has the answer. But amazingly, we're still as fat or are growing fatter than ever, so they don't have the answer. Um, I think that patients are really confused about dietary information out there and I think it makes us as professionals with a more scientific background, sort of frustrated with some of the ideas and concepts that, that patients embrace out there. So clearly they're desperate to, to get their weight down and clearly there's money to be made by companies out there. Okay, so basically what you have to remember is, is that it is about energy balance. Net calories are an issue. A kilojoule is a kilojoule. A calorie is a calorie, however way you want to describe it. So you can see there with um, this picture that I've got up there that the food and beverages, you know, account for 100% of your energy, energy input. So even without exercise, I would argue that there is still something that every obese patient can do, even if they are on a mobility scooter or can't move because they've got d dodgy knees or, or hips or whatever. Certainly some foods will make you feel fuller for longer. So you've got things like high protein foods and also low GI carbohydrates. Um, there's a big hoo-ha about not having any carbohydrates at all. You can still lose weight having carbohydrates. I mean, I went to Japan recently. I didn't see very many fat people over there. Okay, predictive equations. I wanted to highlight this because there are equations out there. There's the Schofield equation and the Harris-Benedict equation. But basically they, and it does depend on whether you're a man or a woman, and it does depend on how much exercise you do um, and so forth and what your height is. But basically it boils down to this. If you want to lose one kilogram per week, it means you need a calorie deficit of 1,000 kilocalories or 4,000 kilojoules a day. 
So if you just consider that the average requirement for a man is 2,500 calories, um, or that boils down to 1,500 kilocalories when you take that away, and for women, you get down to 1,000 calories. I'll just speed it up, I'm running out of time. Okay, common dietary intake themes. These are the themes that I see in a patient who is obese or overweight. Um, it's not simple enough to just say to cut your intake by 25 to 50% because some people might eat three Big Macs in the day and say so cutting it down by half or whatever is still not the right thing to do. Okay, so I think the answer is, is that people should focus on very low calorie diets to get fast or promote the, the fastest weight loss. So three meal replacements per day plus or minus like a serving of, of protein there, so your meat, chicken or fish. Um, usually that's more for the men because you've got a bit more leeway in the amount of calories that you can have each day. And then you've got your non-starchy veggies, low dual ve um, beverages, diet jellies, that kind of thing. But oil there is just written there because there is some evidence of including a teaspoon of oil to reduce gallstones. Using real food instead because some people have got um, intolerances to dairy or they simply hate shakes. They've done them before and they just don't talk. They hate them and they refuse to go on it. So you can achieve a similar result using real food. I would argue it's not quite as effective or quite as fast and the patient would need to stay on it a bit longer but you can still do it. So that's how you would do it. The optimal duration of a VLCD program is six weeks. Two weeks is the absolute minimum um, duration for liver reduction effects. Um, 12 weeks is the maximal duration, but certainly between 6 and 12 weeks you do have a high dropout rate, so they can't do it on their own, they need to be supervised. If you have a longer period of time in mind for the patient to lose weight and their surgery isn't coming up within that time frame, you can go to the OptiFast website there and you can follow their model in reverse. So you would maybe start with one replacement shake in the day, move to two, or one low pro high protein, low carb meal per day, move to two, before you're moving to three in that last phase. Be, be aware that there are contraindications or things that you need to consider when you put people on a VLCD. So they're all listed there. It's not to say that they can't go on it, but you need really um, defined monitoring processes in place. And again, there's a huge document there if you go to the OptiFast um, website. There are, there's a huge booklet there on the comorbidity guidelines. Here, look, but you don't need to take that all in. I just want to say that there are a multitude of shakes and products and so forth out there and some are not deserving to be on the shelf, particularly if you're going to use them for any significant length of time. Um, they vary in their calorie intakes, they vary in their macronutrients and they vary in their micronutrients, which is something to consider. You don't want a patient who's going to end up iron deficient because they've been on a product that doesn't provide enough iron. So OptiFast is considered to be the gold standard. OptiSlim is pretty good too and it's a bit cheaper for the patient. Kickstart's pretty good as well, but you can see the iron's not so great in that one, so I'd put them on a multivitamin as well. But use OptiFast whenever a patient wants to suggest that they use something else. Here, I've just got a nice little table here that sort of shows the effects of different weight loss strategies. So this is why I'm banging on about the VLCDs and not just diet and activity or diet alone. Certainly bariatric surgery is the gold standard there, but you know, patients may not want to do that. Um, if these, these results are obviously in the short term, not in the long term. The other thing to tell your patient is to embrace hunger. Okay, they will <laughs> say that they're hungry, okay, but I would argue it's often head hunger. If they're hungry, they're not sticking to it properly. Sure, they'll be hungry for the first three to five days, but it, and once they reach ketosis, that should settle down. Okay, the last thing is have monitoring or review mechanisms in place. Okay, make sure you engage other health professionals. If you, this is a big job, you can't do it alone and the patient can't do it alone even if they assure you they will bug their wives, they will complain, they'll act like two year olds when they get home, when they can't have dessert or whatever. So you can see then engage a GP and endocrinologist depending on what sort of, um, you know, if the patient's got diabetes or whatever. The dietitian, so align yourself with a dietitian and talk to them about how you would like to work with the dietitian so that you're both doing the same thing and you're, you're on the same page. 
An exercise physiologist may be beneficial, perhaps a psychologist as well. The weight loss has to be supervised for the patient to get the best result. You need to look at all these different measures in their journey. Okay? So self-monitoring can be something useful that they can do, but look, just if they use my fitness pal or whatever, um, just make sure they're doing it properly because often they'll come and tell you they're, they're eating next to nothing but they're actually not recording properly. They'll forget the butter on the sandwich or the sauce on the, the chicken or whatever. Finally, I just want to sort of finish up with a program that is out there. Um, this is run from George's Rooms. It's called Intensive. Um, if you would like to refer to a, a structured program, um, this is the, the place to go. Um, you can just call that 1300 number or if you go to the website, there are referral forms that you can um, download there. You can see that it's got a pretty impressive team um, sort of helping the patient and guiding them through their goals. Um, the patient doesn't just have to be bariatric surgery. This is a pie graph that just shows all the different types of um, specialities that we're dealing with there. And here are the results. So, um, there are different phases that people can follow, so whether it's a three-week program, six-week program, 12-week program or whatever, it will be tailored for them. So you can see the amount of weight loss there. So those are the three things I want you to remember and that's where you can find me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Margie, for demonstrating how hard you work. <laughs> Fantastic. We won't have time for questions, but while we're eating this afternoon, we might be able to continue the conversation. That's lovely. I've got to set off, though. I've got a clinic oh, this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.